the speakers here today and to listen to the Minister of Health expressing his views on uh, how legislation and policy has to change and uh, implement more gender uh, uh, perspective. Um, we have the honor of uh, having here Sara Morton, the director of Community Drugs Program at the University of University College of Dublin. She's been here before. Uh, she was here in 2019 on behalf of Rotem's uh, conference uh, we had then. Her keynote speech is, uh, you can't fix this in six months, which is very uh, good to hear here in Iceland, but we tend to want to fix everything very uh, quickly. So we can't, you can't fix this in six months, the intersectionality of women's substance use. Um, Sarah Morton, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Give her a very warm welcome. Um, I will say I would have been back sooner, but for um, COVID. Um, so it's lovely to be back um, in Iceland and to talk to you about this really important work because I was at a very different stage around understanding gender and women's substance use when I was here in 2019. So what I'm going to do is take you through this particular piece of research that was completed this year. Um, I think it's been pivotal for us in the Irish context. I am also aware that it is um, situated very much in one jurisdiction, but I think you will find that perhaps there are similarities to what women um, may have experienced and some of the issues that we have that are shared around policy, um, I suppose, contexts and challenges. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the background of this work. Um, it has been many years in the making and I'm 10 years now as the director of the Community Drugs Pro Program in University College Dublin. And it was just interesting because it's taken a decade for me to get to this point. And this occurred because of two really important projects, um, one of which had an Icelandic element to it, shall we say. Um, just coming into COVID, we did an action learning piece of research with one of our major um, intervention organizations called Merchants Key in Ireland. And they provide a lot of low threshold um, services originally in Dublin city center, but then in different um, places across the Midlands and in another small city in Ireland. And they felt that they weren't really getting um, and addressing the needs of women who are accessing their services. And there was lots of different dynamics that were happening around that. So we undertook this action learning study, which was responding to women with complex needs who use substances. And we worked with the practitioners um, who were supporting those women. And there was a number of lessons that came out of that study. Um, the second piece of work that we did potentially for our sins in a former life, um, of which um, we also had our lovely um, Icelandic input, was we were all working on this gender approach to drug policy across Europe. Um, this world's during COVID, so we never met each other except on Zoom. So if you're writing a handbook, maybe it's better never to write to meet each other. Um, so we survived that process. But at the very end of it, I was left with this real sense of, I was very surprised when we worked on the European handbook because I said, actually, we seem to be at some of the cutting edge examples in Ireland, which were quite a conservative jurisdiction. Um, you know, there's quite an influence from the Catholic church. And I said, we still, in all of the data and all of the research evidence that we collected, hadn't heard from women's experiences. And I had in my mind this quote, which came from one of the practitioners. And he said, why are we not seeing women before today? they get to these levels of trauma and trouble? Women are hugely underrepresented at the start of their difficulties. They present when something drastic has happened, such as a hospitalization, an overdose, the loss of children. Why are they not asking for help before that? And this was brewing in me. And so we applied for some funding and we commenced what I think has been one of the most important studies um, around this topic um, for the Irish context. So just to go back a step so that you have an understanding, I 
promise I will not wade through all of this literature in great detail because we all need coffee and I believe I stand between you and your coffee this morning. Mm -hmm. um, so there has been lots of developments in policy and practice to the gender dimension, both within our own national drug strategy and some of the related kind of structures. Um, we've also got some initiatives in Ireland around gender specific services and interventions. Although we were so aware of this gap around the intersectionality for women, you know, where did their substance use relate to domestic violence, to homelessness, to transactional sex, and all of these myriad of other issues that very often substance use services um, weren't positioned to respond to. Um, we also knew from the literature that the prevalence data would indicate that women have often very different substance use patterns and trajectories. Um, there's issues such as telescoping, which is essentially that women tend, some women will have a more rapid transition to substance use becoming problematic than say for men, and they also will use different substances, and that may also leave them vulnerable to very gender specific harms, but we wanted evidence on what those might be. Um, we also knew from the literature that women's substance use may intersect with this range of other issues that was including but not limited to life contexts such as poverty and migration status, the impacts of experiences such as trauma history, childhood legacies, um, domestic and sexual violence, and then issues relating to the life course such as impacts of prostitution, homelessness, or involvement within the criminal justice system. Um, a few other points, and one that if you're working with women, you will know is that motherhood becomes this really important interrelated factor. Um, and often pregnancy and birth is a point of intervention for women, um, but it can also enforce stigma and, and shame, as well as reinforce negative beliefs around women's value and identity. So this kind of lack of integrated interventions where this coexistence of substance use, domestic violence and child protection um, was very pertinent to the Irish context. Often involvement in the criminal justice system, um, both internationally and certainly in Ireland is often related to acquisition, crime um, or drug related offences. And you often would see women in repeat offence patterns and experiencing this range of complex issues such as mental health difficulties, history of domestic violence, family and relationship issues, housing problems and health issues. And that was certainly true for the population of women that were ending up in our women only um, prison in Ireland. Um, drug related stigma is widely agreed to impact on identity and well-being, but um, we know that there can be very gender specific factors in this. We're also aware that there's a whole debate around when we talk about a gendered response. So we can be gender sensitive, um, but we are also, some of the literature would say that we actually need to be gender transformative. So not only do we need to be sensitive to the particular needs um, of any particular woman, but we need to be transforming the structural inequalities that have led to some of her difficulties. So we received funding for this study and the aim was to explore the experiences and needs of women who are dealing with multiple issues, including problematic substance use, with a view to gaining that kind of in-depth understanding of women's life experiences, substance use trajectories, and how those related to factors such as motherhood, poverty, social exclusion, residency status, trauma, domestic violence, transactional sex, homelessness and incarceration. Um, I think I was idealistic when I was drawing up the aim. I look back at that now and I say, be careful what you ask for. So sometimes to go into this context and this world is quite overwhelming. So what I'm going to present to you um, is the findings from this study, I'll take you through the methodology very quickly, and it's quite hard to provide a snapshot, but what I've tried to do is communicate or set up slides to communicate essentially the complexity of women's experience around these intersectional issues, but also to really forefront women's experiences in all of this. Um, the objectives were we would explore the, the lived experiences, we define these unique gendered support needs and service pathways, and we hoped that we would inform the future of Irish drug policy and some of the service pathways. 
methodologically for any of you who are interested in that stuff um, or have to be interested in that stuff. We went for qualitative in-depth interviews for those women who were or had experienced um, substance use issues together with other needs. Now, we did put some parameters on that, that they needed to be either currently in contact with relevant services or organizations or have access to those. And that was simply from an ethical perspective. We wanted that women would have the opportunity to get support if need be. Um, they needed to, uh, we wanted to address some of that potential vulnerability and also um, make sure that there was a range of supports available to them as, as a result of participating. Um, but we did include women who were in contact with services, but may not be stabilized in their substance use. They may not have been accessing current treatment pathways, as well as those who were engaged in stabilization, detox and treatment. Um, we went for in-depth interviews of uh, the shortest was 30 minutes. There was one of those and they went for up to 90 minutes. They were audio recorded and they were all done um, by one person, which was me. One of the things that I wanted to apply that I became really preoccupied with is if we were to really consider women's vulnerability, then how was I going to attend to those potential um, vulnerabilities and risks um, for the women participating in the research? Um, and I think this came, there's been a lot of discussion around informed consent. And I suppose my own kind of thinking on it is having worked with women for many decades is that at a particular point or a particular moment, she may um, provide her consent, but she may think in six months time or a year's time or two years time, I'm not sure I wanted to do that. I'm not sure I wanted to say that. Um, and also no matter how hard we work on these issues of power, um, there is also that potential for her to feel that there's a power dynamic. So obviously one can never fully negate all of those tensions and difficulties, but I sought to minimize them in, in the following way. Um, I did all of the interviews, so there was consistency um, across the interview schedule. Um, we ensured that there was direct contact and availability of the researcher um, at all times. So her contact was not with practitioners, it was not with the agency. Once she heard about the research, she was in contact with the person that was going to do the interview and, and hold the whole research process. Um, we ensured that there was completely open recruitment through all of the agencies that we were working with so that there was no gatekeeping occurring at any of the agencies because even consciously or unconsciously, practitioners who are working with these issues are you know, excited about the research and they're thinking now who would be a good woman for that study. Whereas, um, of course, we're always drawn to the women that you know might be a little bit we perceive um, easier to support or that may be more co more coherent around her story. Um, we had very robust debrief and support structures for the women. The data was immediately de-identified and anonymized, so only I am aware of the identity or the participants in relation to the data. Um, we also provided a range of potential interview locations. Obviously, that had to be in a safe location, but there was where she could come on campus at the university or um, in a range of different services. So she didn't want to um, potentially have an interview in a service that she'd been connected to. We could offer her an alternative accessible venue. Um, there was a discussion with each of the participants around confidentiality how the interview would be transcribed, anonymized, and de-identified. There was particular things that I talked to each woman, a woman about. Um, also, say for instance about um, her children, that you know any that they would never be named, obviously, um, that they would never be, um, that we would change specific details um, around those aspects, because very often women were talking in detailed ways about their families, their family structures, and their children. We also um, talked to each woman, or I spoke to each woman, about would she like to see any quotes that we were going to use in the research before it was published, and about half the women said, yes, I would. And the other half said, no, that's fine. I'm very happy with what I've said. And there was always options for women to come back to me if they changed their mind. For those of you, those who wanted all of the quotes and the context in which the quote was said in the report was sent to her 
um, before the report was published. Um, and finally, the participants were told and informed about the quotes that were going to be read out at the launch. So even today, all of the women that I quote today um, have given their permission for this material to be used in, in conferences. So it was just quite interesting and it really raised questions for me about what is truly informed consent. So that's not that moment when she's in crisis and she agrees, but what does that actually look like? Because this became a whole little separate project of its own in terms of that constant checking in with women about them being um, kind of comfortable with their information being used. And what was really interesting, it's the first piece of research I've done where actually about half the research participants came to the launch um, and actually were there when we launched the research. Um, it was quite emotive. So we did qualitative interviews with 14 women. The age ranged from 25 to 60, with the majority falling within that kind of middle age range. Um, they were all white Irish women. So even though we had sought to talk to women about their migration status and whatever, that actually was impossible within the sample. And we did talk about um, the sample reflecting who was accessing the service rather than going for a tokenistic, um, seeking out a woman who was potentially from a different cultural or ethnic background. Um, four of the women were currently using substances with the remaining defining themselves as abstinent. Um, the substances, which was really interesting, so I'm not sure if you have this in Iceland, but there's certainly been periods of time in Ireland where we've gotten caught, quite caught up um, around what type of substance and the meaning of that substance and how we think about treatment and intervention for specific substances. So I suppose I've observed that for a long time. So this was really interesting for me because the women used every and any substance. And this is very specific finding um, around that. But the ones um, just to, to list them were alcohol, cannabis, cocaine, crack cocaine, heroin, and tablets. So medication misuse, which again, I'm guessing you guys might have here also, is that the, the misuse of medication and street medication. Four of the women were in substance misuse residential treatment, and the remaining were accessed or previously accessed either treatment um, substance misuse support service, a homeless service or domestic violence services. So they were coming from a range of backgrounds. I specifically wanted women in the sample that may not have gone through drug and alcohol service interventions. 78% um, or 11 of the women were mothers and the majority had experienced issues with child protection and welfare for their children. Four of the women had involvement in the criminal justice system and the women were currently living across a number of regions um, in Ireland. So there was quite a wide distribution. Um, they weren't just based in one city or location. So deep breath, we get into the findings. And I've tried really hard not to do the thing where you spend most of your presentation talking about everything that happened up until the findings. So what we ended up with was a very, very, very complex data set. Um, it was very rich. Um, it was just steeped in emotion and difficulties. And if I looked for, I wanted intersectionality, my goodness, did I get a data set of intersectionality. So what I did was um, drew out through the um, thematic analysis, these five themes, which were around women's substance use patterns and prevalence, their relationships and their family, um, stigma and shame, the implications and intersectionality, which included mothering, housing and homelessness, transactional sex and prostitution, criminal justice and mental health and trauma. And then engagement with support and interventions, because I had talked to women about like what worked, what didn't work, what do you think needs to change? And they talked about this kind of initial engagement with services and turning points, their pathways through services and policy and practice change. Um, I think I don't communicate very well. It's very hard to put words on the level of trust shown to, to me by the women. Um, and I think attending so carefully to their consent was really important in the data that they've then contributed um, to this study. There was certainly a point, I think I did 
um, something like nine interviews in a three week period. And I actually took nearly a month before I was able to return to further interviews because the, the detail of their lives was um, very difficult to listen to, um, even though there's really clear themes. So I'm going to now talk through some of these themes and I hope I can do these 14 women justice. So for the majority of women, the initiation of use occurred in teenage years um, with, and that was often due to either their family use or availability and use within their wider community settings. And it was often as a result of difficulties, tensions or abuse within their home setting or subsequent to experiences of violence or abuse within a relationship, often commencing with medication misuse in that case. So there was nobody in this study who said, I had, I'm, I'm, I'm being deliberately, I suppose, <laughs> generalizing here, but nobody was saying I had a nice family upbringing. I was a little bit bored and I was 15 or 16 and I started to drink in the park with my friends. That did not occur. So for the women in this study, their substance use was already um, predicated by a number of traumatic or coercive events in their life. Really interesting, the availability and access to substances had such a strong influence on their substance use patterns. So women used whatever was available, okay? So they didn't seek out particular substances in their description about their choice or their substance of choice, it was down to availability, what was in their family, what a partner was using. And very often where there was illicit substances, a partner or a person in the immediate context was often a supplier or assisted with the supply of the illicit substance. Um, for those women who used alcohol only, um, the women tended to either have alcohol only, alcohol and medication misuse or alcohol and poly use of a variety of substances depending on their context, availability, and circumstances. They often described their use, whatever substance they were using, as a way of coping to deal with trauma or a way to exist or to survive. Woman, one of the women said, literally the main part for me, the substance was just having it there. It was just the comfort of having it there. If I had three or four cans left, Jesus, it was literally a hug a comfort, you're okay, you're all right. Regardless of being drunk, obviously, it would have given me confidence that I didn't have. When I think like, geez, I was a completely different person, the alcohol made me, honest to God. And I think back now, it's so messy, it was horrible. It was the person I thought, I always, always used to say, drink makes me who I want to be. And actually it really didn't. When I think back of who I was, when I was drunk, I was like a fool and an idiot. The bit for me, um, both when this woman was communicating this to me and, and explaining it, but also when you look at the quote was this idea of, if I had three or four cans left, it was literally a hug. And when she was describing this, I could actually, you know, it was very visceral. One could feel that um, set of emotions from her and how it would make sense to use um, in that moment. In terms of relationships and families, the majority of the women in the study grew up in households where there was parental substance misuse, um, compromised parenting, and often direct neglect or abuse. Often there was a significant trauma experience within the family or the wider community, um, which may have included direct abuse as well as exposure to violence and to violent contexts. In I, ironically, in this double bind, ex extended family members and key family members were often an important support to women in their journeys of getting help and support and in recovery if that's what they decided to do. And I think for me, undertaking this study, it's not like we don't know this because we work with this with the women that we work with all the time, but it was just interesting to have that evidence. And we tend to, I think, often work with women as individuals, and her story and her narrative makes sense, but when you're listening to woman after woman tell you the same detail around those trauma histories, it really um, makes you consider the impact um, of that and how we respond to her substance use. So many of the women identified particular vulnerabilities they felt they were left with from their childhood experiences, so these childhood legacies. 
um, which then potentially left them open to grooming and exploitation or an abusive relationship in their early teenage years. So at one point about midway through the data collection, I was doing a lot of traveling around Ireland to do this study and I'm driving down the motorway and literally it sounds so simplistic, but it was this thought of there's always a fella, right? <laughs> which sounds like a very Irish way to put it. But in every single woman's story that I had interviewed at that point, there was always this guy who always pitched up at this particular moment in her life and that is when she went from a childhood legacy and a trauma history for 13 out of 14 of the women into a cascade of issues and factors and, you know, more, I suppose, challenging experiences. Um, so I suppose how we might understand that is those childhood legacies left her with particular vulnerabilities to exploitation um, by men who were manipulative or abusive or controlling. Um, these early experiences of exploitation or abusive relationship often resulted in ongoing experiences of abusive relationships, with women reporting experiences of coercive control, sexual violence, physical violence and stalking. So that was for all of the women in the study described those experiences. Domestic violence was a feature of nearly every woman's experience and if a further or previous relationship was considered non-abusive, this was actually highlighted by the women. So rather than saying to me, um, oh, well, it actually turns out that he was quite abusive, she would actually say, oh, well, I was with this particular person or I was in a relationship with the guy and he was actually really nice. So that was an exception for her. And of course, at this point, I was like, mm, was he really nice, though? Was that just compared to the guy before the guy before? Um, so they also, one woman identified a significant relationship as codependent, but not abusive. Um, and a number of women spoke about later relationships that were supportive because we needed a bit of hope at this point. Um, so for a number of women, they actually had partners who were really supportive of their um, kind of recovery and positive change. Um, for most, there was a deep interface between their substance use and their daily experiences of abuse and control. And again, any of us who are working with women and working in this sector, we know this from working with individual women, but it's quite different to have that data set where women are able to describe in detail their daily life and how that experience of abuse and control um, connects with their substance use. So this was for one woman, I'm keeping an eye on the time, um, person can wind me up if I need to go faster. So he was 18 and I was 14 and we lived in the worst places. Um, but anyway, I thought I had my life made. I was with this perfect boy. I could drink, I could have fun at the weekends. I could go to school if I wanted or not. I ended up starting a course. He started beating me. He actually beat me so bad that I was in hospital and I went back to him. He broke stuff off me, snooker cues, and I loved him. I loved him unconditionally, though, and I used to think that that was okay. That's normal because he loved me, so it was okay. Sometimes he'd like to shake people and go, I'm sure people wanted to shake me and say, get away from him. But unless you go through that, you just don't get it. When I left him, I got in a relationship straight away and I had my kids, and this fellow was abusive as well. Now, I didn't put up with him. I moved straight on to another one with another abusive person. I had five miscarriages, and obviously my two kids have passed. So had she actually had two kids that died. I'm not saying he made me lose my kids, but it was all up in that vicious craziness. So um, the stigma piece was really important. It was the third theme. Women spoke about the shame and the stigma they experienced, both about their substance use and the relationship to their children. And that at some time, substances were this way to avoid the feelings of shame that would inevitably arise if she stopped using or reduced her use. Several women described particular elements of their experiences remaining hidden or invisible due to the service approach, for instance, the domestic violence service focusing on her court-based protection orders, regardless of her substance use, her substance use treatment only marginally considering her domestic violence. They also spoke about accessing services for very specific needs and often feared bringing up these wider issues due to the concern about the response from the service provider or the child protection and welfare issues. 
And one of the women spoke so eloquently about her kind of shame and stigma. And she said, the thing is, you're already using drugs. You're well, for me, in my experience, I'm already ashamed that I'm using the type of drugs that I'm using. I can't give you a reason that's good enough as to in relation to the consequences of me using drugs. They don't match up. So she's saying, if you're a practitioner and you're sitting in front of me, I can tell you it's a good enough, a good enough reason for the decisions that I'm making in terms of using. And I'm physically dependent on these drugs as well. And I've been using them for years. And not to add any more shame to the internal shame that we already, I'm going to just say, excuse my language, fucking feel that we shouldn't be using drugs. Society tells us you shouldn't be using drugs. Then as a woman who's homeless and sleeping, a woman who's engaging in sex work to feed her habit, a woman who's injecting all of the other stuff, shaming isn't going to get people anywhere. And it's just to meet people where they're at and encourage them to try and meet their goals. And I just am so struck by that line that she says is that I can't give you a reason that's good enough to explain my decisions because she's never going to be able to explain all of that because she's in this cycle of shame. Intersectionalities, this is a, a lot. So I'm going to move and focus more on the quotes. So the mothering aspect is so important and really interesting for me is that mothers focused on the outcomes of the impact of their experiences on their children rather than the specific dynamics, i.e., you know, what happened to their children, not what happened in the process of what happened to their children, but what was the end result? A number of women named grief and devastation regarding experience of children's deaths, miscarriage and loss of contact, of contact with children. So there was nothing in the study that we specifically inquired about miscarriage or death of children. This, so this was not asked of every woman. So each woman in the study of those that responded in this way of the 45% um, had spontaneously talked about this. So 45% of the mothers disclosed the death of a child or a miscarriage, um, which in all cases had a significant impact on their well-being, often pre precipitating increases in substance use. So very humanly, just um, as a researcher who had to take a break <laughs> right after nine of these interviews, I then got to the point where I'm like, children are dying and these women are miscarrying. And that's, I've worked in this sector for nearly 30 years and I had never known that or understood it because I had worked with women one at a time. And now I have a group of women and I'm like nearly half of these women have miscarried in a way that was very devastating to them at a, a later term miscarriage or their child has died. There was a desire more positively to meet the needs of their children. Um, and this was a motivator for positive change and engagement and treatment. So this was this opportunity for practitioners to have an invitation to a responsibility moment. And even when there was little or no involvement in their lives with their child or their children, and for one woman there was, because of the circumstances, she had done everything right. There was no possibility of her getting care back of one particular child, but she still focused on her own recovery because she said that that even that her child would know or growing up knowing that she um, had made positive changes in her life was really important to her. Homelessness, not surprising, and lack of security in regard to housing was a common experience and often considered normative. Um, and women identified staying in abusive relationships, accessing inappropriate accommodation, utilizing short term accommodation and losing accommodation at various stages of their attempt to deal with their substance use and related issues. So deep breath. And then when my daughter died, it shattered me. It was literally the breaking point for me. And when I find them, which was benzos, I can't describe it. I remember being in treatment and saying this. I was actually in love with the feeling it gave me. And that's why I was so addicted to it. Even if you asked me to this day, do I love them? This was benzos, the boy. Yeah, I did love the way they made me feel. Would I go back? No but they helped me deal with it. Well, I thought they did until I got clean and then I had to deal with it all over again in a normal frame of mind. So it was just interesting the way she was able to articulate, I think, the use of her substance as a response to grief. 
transactional sex and prostitution. So a number of the women, and this is such a hidden issue in Ireland, talked about transactional sex and prostitution, highlighting the invisibility of this issue, particularly in relation to women's substance use. And I talked to that, them in a way I didn't say, have you ever worked in prostitution? I just said, you know, very often women who are using drugs end up exchanging sex for drugs. Is that something that has ever happened for you? And a number of the women responded. Um, they also felt that they could never talk openly about the risks of their experience. Um, and for one woman, it was particularly poignant because she was in a mixed gender um, substance use treatment. She had never worked in, in prostitution or sex work, whatever terminology. She said it was really interesting to hear about um, how women were spoken about. So on the mixed gender treatment program, men were talking about going out for the weekend and using prostitutes at the weekend. And in group settings, they were listening to this. Um, and for some, then they had to hide their own experiences of prostitution and sexual exploitation. Um, there was an intersection of domestic violence and substance use related offences. Um, and another theme that emerged or an interesting development was two of the women had experienced digital or online sexual exploitation. Um, and that had really, when they were trying to make positive changes in their life and um, engage in recovery actions, um, they were then uh, had this perpetrated against them and there was very poor response from the police around it. The majority of the women had experienced some form of mental health with um, issues with two having um, significant mental health diagnosis. Um, all described their mental health as intersecting with their substance use and linked to previous traumas. So I'm going to keep going a little bit faster. And one woman spoke about this in terms of then the cycle started off with the shame and the things that were happening to me out in the streets, meeting men and what they were doing to me, always been abused, raped, I'd say, because I didn't want to have sex. I wanted money. I needed money for drugs. But then I needed to be out of my head to do what I was doing. So I was left in this cycle of I can't do one without the other. Another woman said the court, court re-traumatizes you. Every time I go back, I have to have a good session, a good old drink the night before. I just have to. I can't cope with it otherwise because I don't sleep. So I can't cope. So I have to. Every time I go back, this is to court. I drink when I know it's coming because it's just the way the judges talk to you. And they're so awful. One judge basically implied I was a liar and I was deliberately dragging it out to cause him distress. And you're not thinking clearly because, well, my mental health was destroyed. So it's like, which is killing me quicker? Do you know what I mean? Is it the mental health aspect of your mind is absolutely tortured? Or is it the drugs that are affecting your mental health? What took me so long was because my mental health was so bad. And you're telling me to stop using the drugs when the drugs are the one thing. It might not be healthy, but it's a coping mechanism. And it's the only one that I've got. So you're telling me to stop that. You're telling me that you're going to need to stop using drugs in order to access services. But my mind is tortured by the abuse. It's a really difficult one. So we then moved on in the conversations around, you know, where are the pathways? Um, there were three circumstances that precipitated women into seeking support. So I was surprised that there was such a strong finding in relation to this. Involvement in the criminal justice system, the needs of their children and personal health issues. So I think that's really important for us as policymakers and as practitioners, because there's three clear possibilities where you have a moment to influence positive change in a woman's life. Um, issues in relation to children that had the potential to trigger positive change were either children being temporarily or permanently taken into care, pregnancy, a new baby, or advancing needs of the children. So for instance, a change in school or um, something that the child may have needed at that time. The health concerns were the third possibility and either a new health issue or a complication of chronic issues that were associated with or implicated by ongoing substance use were often what women described as the turning point. Um, barriers to substance use status Barriers to accessing services were not surprising. Her substance use status, childcare, geographical location, 
the mixed gender nature of the service, as well as the particular treatment or intervention approach so linked to these issues around stigma and shame. Child's inclusive residential treatment was welcomed, although there were minor issues for women. We have two treatment centres in Ireland now that um, women can bring their children up to preschool age. Um, but for one woman did point out that that's challenging and that you're meeting the needs of your child while trying to also manage the recovery piece for yourself. Um, for the women who had access to domestic violence or service that supported women with substance use issues, she felt that this was absolutely essential in her recovery. Um, the other things that they talked about was these missed opportunities for interventions when they were children or young adults. And they said, you know, I was, I look back now, I was clearly vulnerable. Um, I was engaged with services and nobody intervened to stop this. And I think that's quite a, a difficult piece for us to hear because every time we meet a young person who's between those ages, um, particularly when you're getting to that 10 to 15, if we're not intervening, then we're potentially allowing another pattern to go through another generation. Um, they talked about the safety and importance of services responding to everything that she might disclose or talk about. Um, and then they talked about this unraveling the effects of what had happened and how long it would take, which is partially where we're going to come to the title. The other thing that I think gives us hope is they spoke about so many women talked about one practitioner or agency that was their key. So where there was one practitioner that was there for them no matter what, or one agency that never turned them away, that was often something they described as pivotal um, for positive change. This woman said, um, with a bit of a sense of humor, she said, where do I turn for help? And she was repeating this conversation. And she said, she gets told, well, not here. And that's when I started going, can someone tell me the directions to somewhere else? Because she'd be told, you need to go somewhere else. And she's like, or what was the other thing I used to get? Um, or there's some people or, over there, or I don't know, there's a term I heard a lot. And it's like, she ended up saying, can you tell me where to get to this somewhere else that I can get help? Do I go down the road and do I turn left and then take a right? Um, and I was literally like, where is this somewhere else? Can you send me a pin to it on Google? Um, can you Google this somewhere else place, please? I just have a laugh when she said this. Um, so it's just interesting because it really makes us think about when do we say to women, oh, we can't deal with that here. All right. And, and what kind of influence does that have or effect does it have on her? And then this... Um, woman who we eventually ended up um, using this as the quote, she said, I just think that these care plans, this idea of a care plan for any service that a woman is involved in, we love our care plans at the minute in Ireland, um, they're not long enough, they're just not long enough. Recovering from substance use, addiction, whatever you want to call it, recovering from all of those intersectionalities, domestic violence, sexual abuse, rape, prostitution, you can't fix that in six months. We had four policy and practice implications. One is that women's substance use needs to be viewed through the lens of potentially multiple experiences of abuse, trauma, and exploitation, rather than a single trajectory of substance use. The exploitation, abuse, and need for safety for women seeking support needs to be res recognized, responded to, and embedded in every service that she may access. There needs to be ongoing attention to prescribing, availability, um, misuse and overdose risk of medication, particularly um, benzos and in the Irish context, pregabalin, both of which were highlighted in this study as a high risk for dependency and for overdose. Um, and we're seeing that in our drug related death. And finally, policy and intervention approaches need to look at how to strengthen opportunities for positive change for women engaging in statutory and other services, particularly where there's an initial episode of criminal justice or there's a child protection and welfare involvement, because that's when women said that things changed for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this really interesting yeah. research. And I think it's safe to say that it would be wonderful if we could uh, replicate this research here in Iceland. And I'm sure that we will have similar findings. 